Thank you, Dr. Bowers. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, um, that's for sure. I took a big risk this morning and added a few slides. Uh, I'm supposed to be done at 9.30, right? You, you have the full time. Okay, thank you. What do you say is valuable? So, uh, one of my colleagues uh, said, you know, I told him what I was doing this weekend, and uh, he said, that's an easy talk, right? And I go, no, not actually. It's, a, it's such an important talk, and uh, you get the toughest questions uh, from this audience. Uh, most important, of course, but... Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you for your attendance. So what about ovarian cancer, or the ovary in general? It's such a, a diverse uh, organ in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the types of problems that can happen, not just tumors or neoplasms, but because of the diversity of the types of tissue within the ovary, the germ cells, the connective tissue, the glandular tissue, all um, within the ovary, multiple uh, problems or types of tumors can arise um, within this organ, the ovary. Uh, you can have non-tumor type problems like cysts, functional cysts, uh, related to polycystic ovary, things like that, non-cancer problems related to the ovary, endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, but in terms of tumors, it's still quite diverse, heterogeneous, if you will. Multiple types of tumors are possible. Let me see if I get this right here. So this is kind of how we've categorized ovarian tumors for years. Um, and it relates to major classifications in terms of the type of the tissue or the type of the cells. So the uh, glandular cells, the most common type of tumor in the ovary is the epithelial type tumors. And uh, serous cell type, in other words, what type of cell it is, what it looks like under the microscope, is the most common. And when you pick up a magazine article or something on information about ovarian cancer, you hear statistics, it's almost always about epithelial ovarian cancer and almost always pertains to serous epithelial ovarian cancer. But uh, if you look at the whole universe of ovarian tumors and ovarian cancer, it's uh, quite a mixed bag, heterogeneous uh, groups of types of tumors and cancers. So if I say tumor, I probably refer to a benign, non-cancerous uh, disease. And if I say cancer, obviously that's uh, malignant. That's better, I think. So. Our second most common type of tumor and or cancer is the germ cell cancers. And that has a number of types, uh, cell types within it. And then the least common is the sex cord stromal tumors, which is a connective tissue within the ovary and there's multiple cell types there. Other types of cancers can spread to the ovary, metastatic from the stomach, for instance, from breast cancer, uh, that's uh, possible as well. So there's other uh, factors that might be present that uh, can give us a hint in terms of risk of malignancy. If a woman presents with a mass, a tumor, an adnexal mass. So age is probably the uh, primary determinant in terms of risk of malignancy. And as the older the patient is, the older the woman is, the higher risk of malignancy, 10 or 12 times risk menopausal versus younger woman in her 20s. And if a menopausal woman shows up, presents to us with an adnexal mass or a tumor, uh, it's about a 50% risk that might be malignant, but it depends on other features as well. If we look at the most common types of cancer by age group, uh, germ cell tumors or cancers are the most common in young women or even girls, so age 10 to 30 years old in general. The sex cord stromal tumors, that connective type tissue, tumor is primarily menopausal women, but there's a group of patients in uh, younger ages that this can happen as well. The epithelial tumors are primarily menopausal age, but uh, young women uh, can suffer from uh, malignancy of uh, ovarian cancer, epithelial ovarian cancer, and uh, the borderline classification, that's more common in younger women. So again, if we have a 
young patient uh, with an adnexal mass, there's a large differential diagnosis. Uh, if it's a germ cell tumor, the most common tumor, which is benign in women, is the teratoma or the dermoid tumor. That's benign. The malignant form of this tumor is the immature teratoma, and the most common germ cell tumor is the dysgerminoma. Then, a, then each cell type, again, has a benign type and a malignant uh, type. So for the glandular tumors or the epithelial tumors, adenoma is benign and malignant is uh, adenocarcinoma, if you will, invasive epithelial adenocarcinoma. For stromal tumors, there's benign subtypes and malignant subtypes. Sorry, I'm trying to get close to this microphone. It's difficult. <laughs> so just to show you what a teratoma looks like, it presents with a usually a smooth walled but kind of multi-cystic mass and inside it has multiple types of uh, appearances because this is a germ cell tumor and germ cells have the potential to turn into any type of tissue uh, in the human body. So you can see hair, skin, fat, teeth, bone cartilage, uh, neur neural tissue. So it's uh, quite an interesting tumor but almost always benign. So again, there's different types of germ cell cancers or malignancies. The dysgerminoma is the most common. Uh, endodermal sinus tumor is another type, and then immature teratoma is the second most common. To kind of summarize the germ cell tumors and stromal malignancies, because I want to get into epithelial ovarian cancer, overall they're pretty uncommon or rare. They almost always present in young women, or girls even, uh, as a pelvic mass, and usually they'll have symptoms related to a pelvic mass. They usually uh, present quite quickly. In other words, patient's asymptomatic and then starts having symptoms that aren't really lingering, but uh, quite acute, uh, that get them into the emergency room or to see a doctor and diagnosed with a mass. Almost always they're limited to the ovary, stage one, fortunately. Uh, you can have advanced stage germ cell malignancies. Uh, fortunately, for most of these young women, we're able to offer fertility sparing options, uh, surgery and or chemotherapy. And fortunately, most of these germ cell malignancies are curable. They're extremely sensitive to chemotherapy and occasionally radiation therapy is used. Uh, even the advanced stage malignancies are quite curable. The stromal tumors, which are rare, are most often stage one and usually just cured with the surgery. They are responsive to chemotherapy as well, uh, less so than, say, the germ cell malignancies. Uh, as I said, I want to get right into the uh, epithelial ovarian cancer because that's the most common group overall. Uh, and uh, so there's, you know, about 22,000 cases a year in the United States of ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, more than half of the patients eventually die of this disease. It's the most common cause of death in patients that suffer from a gynecologic malignancy. About a 1 to 2 percent risk in a lifetime overall for women. The major problems is that the majority of patients that are diagnosed with epithelial ovarian cancer present with advanced disease. Uh, disease spread outside the ovary and the survival rates are not as good for advanced disease as you would imagine or know. If we could catch this disease earlier, find it earlier in stage one or two disease, we have much better opportunity to cure patients. We don't have a reliable screening test and as opposed to say an adnexal mass in a young woman with a germ cell tumor, uh, usually we don't have any heralding early symptoms. Most of the symptoms that occur with epithelial ovarian cancer are symptoms of advanced disease and maybe as most of the patients or um, folks in the crowd know, there are symptoms associated with all other types of common problems like GI, distress, stomach upset, bloating, gas, things like that. There has been progress in the treatment of ovarian cancer. That's the, not the topic of my discussion, but just to kind of highlight the uh, problem in general and get to the diversity in terms of types of disease. Over the last three to four decades, the 
average survival for patients with epithelial ovarian cancer has gone from 12 to 15 months to closer to 60 months now. Uh, most of this uh, benefit in terms of improvement and survival has unfortunately not been related to curing the disease, in other words, it never comes back, but to better responses to treatment and patients living longer, but unfortunately dying of the disease. Therefore, this is an ideal disease for uh, a great, uh, an effective screening test because uh, there's a risk of death, death and there's uh, enough prevalence, uh, unfortunately not quite enough for a good screening test. So these are criteria for an effective screening test. Uh, and one um, important criteria is that we understand the natural history of disease uh, to apply this uh, screening test effectively. And that, this relates to the diversity of ovarian cancer, that it's not one type of disease. An effective screening, a screening test is effective if the treatment's more effective earlier than later, and that would apply for ovarian cancer. Uh, it's a good test if it's acceptable to the population. It doesn't have a lot of cost or side effects. And a problem that we have with trying to screen for ovarian cancer is that a blood test or an ultrasound is not that costly, but it might lead to many unnecessary surgeries. But my the topic of my talk isn't screening but it relates to the natural history of disease. And so probably one of the most important uh, features that needs to be present uh, to have an effective screening test is a relatively long um, period of time where the disease is pre-invasive uh, or early stage before it becomes advanced or spread, in this case, outside of the ovary. Um, and as we know, most ovarian cancer is diagnosed advanced. So we don't have a test that's catching the disease before it's cancer, or at least before there's symptoms in the early stage. Another way to look at this is a timeline in terms of the amount of disease, or you could correlate that with stage of disease, and time it takes to get there. So again, unfortunately, with most patients with ovarian cancer, we're finding advanced stage disease uh, by the time we diagnose and initiate the treatments that we have available. Screening, we want to be down here. And if we could prevent the disease, even before we could screen, this is where we'd like to be. So we do um, have the ability, or it's usually good luck if we find ovarian cancer early epithelial ovarian cancer, if a patient presents to us with a mass, or in some cases it's just discovered on an annual examination without any symptoms. Uh, it may look differently on an ultrasound, but these are characteristics of suspicious masses where it's uh, termed complex. In other words, it's not just a simple cyst, but has uh, different layers of walls or solid areas or what looks kind of like papillary features, and this is what these tumors would look like um, to the naked eye. So unfortunately, this is where we usually, this is the condition that we're usually finding ovarian cancer, uh, actually making the diagnosis at the time of surgery for a patient presenting with abdominal distension, bloating, uh, a typical term I feel, eight months pregnant, uh, become full more easily with the eating, uh, suspicious for an intra-abdominal cancer, malignancy. We take the patient to surgery. We may or may not find a large ovarian mass, but we find disease throughout the abdomen. This is disease on the omentum. This is in the pelvis with little nodules of disease next to the uterus on the ovaries, next to the colon. This is unfortunately the typical presentation or how ovarian cancer is diagnosed. We <clears throat> tend to manage most patients at surgery if it's early. Uh, so usually the diagnosis is confirmed at the time of surgery. We may be suspicious that there's ovarian cancer prior to surgery or think there's ovarian cancer there. So then at the time of surgery, we need to confirm the diagnosis and then we need to decide is the disease localized or spread uh, 
Many times it's obvious that it's outside of the ovary, but if it's not, then we need to define that by taking many samples within the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, take some fluid out, biopsy the surfaces of the abdomen, the peritoneal surfaces, and lymph nodes. But if there is advanced disease, as illustrated on the previous slide, then uh, our preference anyways is a maximum effort at debulking or cytoreductive surgery um, in that situation. There are some, and again, my talk is in treatment, there are other situations where that's not feasible or ideal either. So again, just kind of a highlight of some of the advances in ovarian cancer. That's a combination mostly of better treatment, chemotherapy treatment. The, the GOG, which is our multi-institutional NCI-sponsored uh, trial group. A number of trials, again, over the last 30 years with advances in the median survival or average survival of ovarian cancer to now over an average survivor of over uh, five years in the best case scenarios with interperitoneal chemotherapy. So a combination of better chemotherapy, but uh, better training in terms of uh, surgeons and uh, better support for the patient after a big surgery in, the, in uh, tertiary hospitals especially. So this is kind of a timeline uh, put together by, oops, sorry, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Bob Coleman, put this kind of timeline together. So our best... <coughs> Our only opportunity really to cure a patient with ovarian cancer is with surgery and usually then with chemotherapy and then we may cure the patient. In other words, the disease um, may never come back. Um, so th that would be with this initial surgery, staging and or cytoreductive or debulking surgery. There might be an interval surgery in there, but the key is chemotherapy, whether it's intravenous or IP. Whether or not a patient gets maintenance chemo is an issue. There's a study just concluding on that. These patients may be cured. Um, unfortunately, the majority of patients progress and then will receive a number of cycles or types of chemotherapy in there. Uh, maybe a surgery, most patients not. This is the typical natural history uh, of this disease. So in terms of, uh, is it one type of disease? Well, it's definitely not. We have our typical classifications, the glandular type or epithelial type, the most common, germ cells, younger women, stromal tumors, or even spread of other cancers to the ovary. I'm gonna, the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on the epithelial type, which is the most common, and serous is the most common type of epithelial ovarian cancer. But within there, uh, there's different ways to classify the disease or characterize it. <clears throat> Again, the cell type is the first way we'll do that um, beyond the tissue type. So tissue type's the first way we'll classify it. Then cell type, is it serous, endometrioid, clear cell? That's another, this, the next way that we'll classify it. Is it a benign tumor? Is it malignant or cancer? Or, or is it in between, which is borderline, and Fortunately, borderline's closer to benign than malignant in terms of its uh, aggressiveness. Uh, what is its grade? So its cell type is characterized under the microscope or designated from what it looks like under the microscope. But then the grade basically defines how aggressive is it. Uh, so we use grade one, two, or three. Grade one is the least aggressive, and grade three is the most aggressive, most epithelial ovarian cancer presents as a grade three serous type tumor. And then the last, and probably most of the time, most important way we'll characterize uh, the behavior of the tumor is the stage. And stage uh, is simply defines where is it? Is it confined to the ovary? Is it uh, outside of the ovary, but pretty close to it or in uh, geography, if you will, in the pelvis, or is it, in terms of ovarian cancer, the most usual stage, or the most common stage that we discover, advanced stage, stage three, which would uh, define anywhere within the abdominal cavity, outside of the pelvis. In the last uh, five, ten years, we're uh, trying to define uh, this disease uh, better, not just those traditional uh, uh, mechanisms of defining disease, stage, grade, cell type, but also 
uh, more scientifically in terms of its mechaniz mechanisms of action. Uh, Dr. Kerman is a pathologist, a gynecologic pathologist, and he's classified ovarian cancer into two different major groups in terms of type of disease. And this is epithelial ovarian cancer. And so type one, which is less aggressive, is most often a low-grade histology, whether it's low-grade serous, endometroid, clear cell, or mucinous cell types. Uh, in terms of its behavior, it's most commonly early stage, but whether it's early stage or more advanced stage, it's uh, more indolent, uh, slower growth, uh, less likely to spread, even if it's spread, slower growing. Its prognosis is better, but patients can still die of this disease. Why? Um, because it's more chemo-resistant, more uh, resistance to the chemotherapy agents that we have available to us now. So if it's advanced stage, patients may live uh, quite a long period of time, but chemotherapy is not effective. Uh, other ways we have to, to define this disease, uh, again, it's not one disease, is it's uh, oh, biologic characteristics uh, from a genetic basis or mutations that occur, so there's, that occur. So there's different markers or genetic mutations that occur within this group of cancer versus the type two cancers. So the type two cancers are the more aggressive types of epithelial cancer. High grade serous, high grade endometroid, or the most poorly differentiated type of uh, epithelial cancer. And again, these are usually advanced stage. They present rapidly, grow rapidly. Uh, they are responsive, uh, the majority are, do respond to chemotherapy. They have different markers if we look on, uh, can identify a mutation or a uh, pathway mechanism that's abnormal. They're different than the type 1 group. This is where we see the BRCA abnormalities, uh, P53, if you're familiar with those terms. But the, the main uh, message is they have different mechanisms of how they uh, develop or um, what defines them. So the most common ovarian cancer that we see is high-grade serous epithelial carcinoma. Again, if we pick up a magazine article, uh, information packet, uh, bulletin, it's usually referring to this, high-grade serous carcinoma usually advanced stage disease, stage 3C would be the most common stage. Fortunately, most patients are sensitive, uh, the, this disease is sensitive to chemotherapy, but unfortunately, most patients, the disease eventually recurs, not all patients. How does it occur? We think now it likely arises within the fallopian tube, not the ovarian itself, but within the lining of the fallopian tube, uh, the, kind of the end of the fallopian tube, that's the fimbria. Uh, if you've seen uh, pictures of a fallopian tube, I should have one up there actually now that I'm looking at this slide. The, the end that kind of looks like a sea anemone um, with the fronds and, uh, and that's open of course to the ovary and so if there's an adnexal mass, you know, a tumor that arises from this, it's probably from cells, cancer cells from this fallopian tube that just implant on the ovary, create that mass. There's different markers or mutations that occur. Again, the P53 or the BRCA pathway are prominent for this type of cancer, and this is the most common type. But we have a serous tumor that's low grade, as I mentioned. It's rare, slow growing. Basically, they're cured with surgery if they're advanced stage disease. We don't give them chemotherapy if we discover this tumor. We just remove it and stage the patient. If they're advanced stage, we may or may not offer chemotherapy, depending on how well this is defined under the microscope. Um, we may give them chemotherapy if their disease is growing, but they tend to be chemo-resistant. We'll give it a shot, but uh, they tend to be chemo-resistant. So it's, again, ovarian cancer is not one disease. There's different behaviors and there's different mechanisms, there's different mutations, if you will, that occur. Uh, this tumor might have a precursor. It might be a benign ovarian tumor. It might be uh, a borderline malignancy or borderline tumor, whereas the serous of the uh, fallopian tube, that's more difficult to define, although there may be a precursor there too as well. 
mucinous ovarian cancer. That's mucinous, again, is the cell type, which is a glandular cell type that's more common, say, in the stomach or the lining of the colon or small bowel, but uh, colon and stomach especially. And under the microscope, mucinous ovarian cancer looks like a mucinous cancer of the colon. It's rare, it's often early stage, and therefore cured with surgery if it is. If it's advanced stage, it tends to be more chemo-resistant. Um, we, we really don't have a precursor that we can recognize in the gynecologic tissues. That's mullerian, mean gynecologic tissues. And it's most similar to gastrointestinal tumors. And even under the microscope, or um, genetically or biochemically, the pathophysiology, the mutations, the markers that we find are most similar or even identical to GI, gastrointestinal tumors. So it's a different disease, different mechanism of uh, occurrence, pathophysiology, if you will. And maybe this group of tumors needs to be bundled with uh, colon cancers of similar types and studied and treated that way. Endometroid ovarian cancer, endometroid is if endometrial is the lining of the uterus. And that cell type uh, can also be within the ovary as far as uh, abnormal finding, whether it's a benign tumor or cancer. It's infrequent. Uh, we can frequently diagnose it early stage, but uh, there's advanced stage or high-grade variants, in other words, more poorly differentiated variants that end up being uh, advanced stage and act more like the high-grade serous tumor. It tends to be chemosensitive, uh, so we usually put this group of tumors along with the high-grade tumors when we think of it in terms of type of disease. Uh, it can be associated with endometrial cancer. It likely re arises in endometriosis or uh, a major uh, way that it can come about is within endometriosis. It has different markers or mutations, so there's a different mechanism of action. It's a different disease than that most common cell type, the serous, high-grade serous cell type. Clear cell is another infrequent type, uh, about 10% of ovarian cancer. If we find this early stage, it has a better prognosis, and surgery is probably the most important treatment there, or even if it's locally advanced in the pelvis, because again, this likely arises within an endometriosis, and endometriosis may not just be in the tubes or ovaries, it might be in some of the pelvic tissues. So surgery is very important with this type of tumor as well. They tend to be chemo-resistant, uh, not all of them. Um, in terms of its behavior or the way it comes about, the pathophysiology, if you will, it tends to be... Uh, have similarities to some types of kidney cancer, or renal cell carcinoma, in terms of mutation, markers, behavior, and again, so maybe some types of clear cell tumor might be best studied as a group along with some types of kidney cancer, or renal cell carcinoma. So, so again, even the epithelial ovarian cancers are not one type of disease. They look different under the microscope. We give them different names, of course, but they likely arise different areas or organs, tissues in the body, and they have different mechanisms of the, in terms of the process where these tissues become malignant or cancerous. So that gets into our next speakers, therapeutic strategies. Our traditional therapeutic strategies, where as I noted, there have been improvements in our cis-platinum or carboplatinum-based chemotherapies, the way we give the tr uh, treatment, intravenous, IV, or within the abdomen, intraperitoneal, the multiple uh, second line or subsequent agents that we have available, multiple improvements. But uh, we're rapidly recognizing that it's not just different cell types or tissue types. Uh, these different chemotherapies are likely to work differently depending on the mechanism that the disease comes about, so uh, the, the different type of ovarian cancer that it is. And uh, currently there's treatments available to us that uh, we know may or may not work better with these different cell types or types of ovarian cancer, the anti-angiogenesis agents, PARP inhibitors in patients with BRCA mutations or tumors that have BRCA-like 
uh, mutations. We know that some chemos might, chemotherapy agents might work better uh, in patients with a BRCA mutation. Um, there might be some novel therapeutic agents that work better in selected cases, but only selected cases of ovarian cancer. Again, because it's different types of disease. And what we need is better agents for some of these rare types of tumor or uh, uncommon tumors with different mechanisms of uh, uh, their pathophysiology, as well as better treatments for our traditional uh, treatments for high-grade serous tumors. And so that's why we need better continued research in defining the mechanism of disease, identifying uh, targeted therapies of cancer in general is just such a complicated uh, mechanism. I think most of the folks in the crowd know that cancer is not one type of disease in general. And then even ovarian cancer alone is quite a diverse uh, type of malignancy with many different mechanisms. Therefore, we have to identify these potential targets by understanding these mechanisms and adapt adaptation to resistance to treatment, and uh, it's where clinical trials are just extremely important. Any good clinical trial now has translational research components with it. In other words, the tissue from that patient on the trials being banked, and uh, the mechanism of disease studied further so that we can see how the, not only the patient responds to the agent on that trial, but maybe identify new targets for better treatment later. And I think I'm done there, yes.